Hello, everyone, and good morning for those in Brazil. Good afternoon for those who are attending this webinar in Europe. And welcome to one, one more webinar uh, organized by the European Researchers in Brazil, the Association of European Researchers in Brazil. Uh, our association provides a space where European researchers working in Brazil can get together and discuss how to improve collaboration with the European research area. We work on facilitating the integration of European researchers moving to Brazil for short or long term and on promoting networking amongst the members. We also aim at amplifying and improving the collaboration of researchers based in Brazil with Europe. And uh, if you are a European researcher in Brazil, you can join our association for free and thus uh, enter our community and get access to all the contents that we prepare. And today we are here for one more webinar uh, of the series dedicated of Drop the Mystery on the Brazilian Academy for European Researchers. And today the topic is how to get a postdoc position in Brazil. So to discuss this topic, we welcome our two speakers, uh, Paolo Denis Gessini and Sébastien Antoine. So uh, Dr. Paolo Gessini uh, is currently a professor at the University of Brasilia, where he has instrumental in establishing a graduation course in aerospace engineering in 2012, uh, in the wake of his postdoc at the Brazilian National Institute for space research uh, that he performed between uh, 2006 to uh, 2009. And after obtaining his PhD from the University of uh, Southampton in UK in 2006, he also co-founded Mars Space, uh, which is a small company specialized in space and plasma technologies. And he was the director of this company from 2007 to 2008. Um, 11, sorry. And today we have also um, the pleasure to welcome Sébastien Antoine, who is visiting professor uh, at the, the Federal University of Pernambuco. Sébastien holds a PhD in social and political sciences from the University, uh, Cat Catholic University of Louvain in Belgium. And he, he is a former fellow of the Brazilian Higher Education Agency, CAPES, uh, from an international program called SPRINT, and is uh, very active in doing collaboration between Brazil and uh, Europe. So welcome, Paolo. Welcome, Sebastian. And so uh, to begin this webinar, I would like to ask you to talk about your experience uh, as a postdoc in Brazil to explain how you succeeded to get this position and uh, to give all the, the tips that you can to uh, our audience. So Paulo, if you want to start, we are listening to, to you. You can share uh, your slides. Uh, good morning to everybody or good afternoon, depending on uh, where you are. Okay, so um, I just prepared actually a small presentation, but mostly I will uh, speak about uh, my experience. Um, <clears throat> so basically, um, I'm here at the University of Brasilia now, I've been here a long time, but uh, I arrived in Brazil, I did not stay all this time, um, as a postdoc. So basically, my um, my arrival in Brazil actually arrived at the end of 2006, uh, but the scholarship started right at the beginning of 2007. So I arrived um, uh, in Sao Paulo, in Guarulhos, I still remember, it was the end of October uh, of 2006, um, uh, to do a postdoc at INPE, uh, the Brazilian National Institute for Space Research, which is in San Jose dos Campos, uh, one hour from the capital. OK, and I came there with a scholarship from FAPESP, which is the Foundation for Research Support of the State of Sao Paulo, one of the biggest, largest institutions, most powerful and the richest institutions in, in Brazil. They've got quite a lot of money. And especially when I arrived there, much more. OK, they still they still do a lot of stuff, but that was a good period. Like 2006 was, um, uh, was an amazing period. 
Um, and then I stayed actually one more year at INPE with a scholarship from CNPK, which is the Brazilian National Council for Scientific and Technological Development. Okay, so it's a federal um, institution. So basically in Brazil, actually you have uh, two uh, big avenues uh, of funding. Actually you have multiple avenues, but there are two types. Okay, you have either federal agencies like uh, like uh, CNPK, CAPES, uh, FINEC, something like it for the whole of Brazil. Brazil is a is a um, <clears throat> is a federal state. Okay, so the states have uh, some autonomy, even if the central government is uh, probably stronger than in the U.S. I guess I think it is, but there is a lot of uh, autonomy. Autonomy. Okay, so you have also state agencies. Actually, every state has got its own. Uh, FAPI, Fundação de Apoio à Pesquisa, Foundation for Support of Research, uh, FAPESP for the city of Sao Paulo, FAPDF uh, for the District of Federal, the federal district where I'm living now, where Brasilia, the capital is. Okay, so basically, first of all, you have like two, these two levels, you know, lots of state agencies and also federal agencies, or two different levels. Okay, uh, most important thing to uh, point out was that in both cases, these scholarships were not requested by me, but were requested by a researcher in Brazil. Okay, so the same thing they did, for example, in 2014, when, as, when I was already a professor at UMB, I arranged a scholarship for my former PhD supervisor from Southampton. That those were the times where the Census and Fronteras, the Science Without Borders program was still active. And so there was uh, a bounty of like man money and scholarships to invite people from abroad and to send people from Brazil abroad. So it was very good. Those times are end have ended now, unfortunately. Let's hope they, they come again. Okay. So, but the important thing was that um, these scholarships were requested from Brazil. Okay. So basically, if you want to come to Brazil, uh, or go to Brazil for me, I say come because I'm here. If you want to go to Brazil, um, what do you have to do in, practically? So yeah, first of all, get some contact in Brazil. Okay. Um, you know, like, you know, you'll see like, well, um, I already had a personal contact from my, uh, from my former supervisor. He, he had met um, the person at IMPE during a Congress, but otherwise you just, you know, get in touch, see who is doing things that interest you and you know, get in touch with them uh, because it is them who like, actually have to submit the proposals, okay? So get some contact in Brazil uh, and say that you're interested in coming, you want to do something, you want to spend some time, uh, do a postdoc, be a visiting researcher or something, okay? Um, so, and what, you what I did and what you should do probably, you help them the preparation of the proposal, okay? And you also will help them with the prestação de contas, you know, when they have to actually uh, do the, the, the relatorio, the, the, <clears throat> the report at the end of the project and justify all the expenses and everything, you will help them with that. By that time, you will have learned a little bit of the vagaries of the Brazilian system. Okay, what I actually did while I was finishing my, my PhD at Southampton, I wrote my project in English, was a little no Portuguese at the time. I sent it to Gilberto San Donato, who was my boss, was going to be my boss at IMPE. And he, what did he do? He translated, of course, everything into Portuguese and cast it into the format that FAPESP wanted. Okay. Because he had already lots of projects. So he required a postdoctoral scholarship for me within the framework of his research. Okay. So he knew how to do that. You would not know because, you know, uh, every country has got its own peculiarities and Brazil has got a lot of peculiarities. So it's very different the way things work here from the way things work in the US or, or in Europe, okay? So I arrived there at the end of October and basically I started my life of going every day to IMPE and working in the lab. I was doing experimental research. So I was actually there all the time, um, okay? The good thing is that uh, you will not be required to teach 
during a postdoc. That what happens generally. Maybe at a the university, they will ask you to do something, uh, do some lectures if you want to. Maybe you will want to do that. But INPE um, is a research institute, so they only have a post graduation. Okay, they don't have graduate co undergraduate courses, so they don't, don't, don't do a lot of teaching. So basically, I was spending all my time uh, in the lab with the researchers. Uh, well, the like probably by first. A uh, Brazilian friend was a master student who was working with me. So with him probably I started practicing my Portuguese. But you know, there is no urgency. You know, everybody there will know English. You will, uh, you will get around no problem at work. But if you really want to enjoy and make the, the best of your experience, like in every place, uh, start learning Portuguese. Because outside work, you know, uh, Brazilians are amazing. I have nothing that is not great to say about this country. They're very welcoming, they're very nice, they're very helpful, they love foreigners. There is nobody here, I haven't met a single person who's got any problem with foreigners in Brazil, okay? You know, at, at, the, at, the, at the worst, you can see that they will be curious, okay? They will ask questions, they will want to know, but it's always um, extremely nice. I haven't met a single person that gives you the impression of like, what the hell are you doing here? You're taking our jobs or bullshit like this, okay? This doesn't happen. This doesn't happen in Brazil. Uh, they do love foreigners. I say that the worst thing you can say that sometimes they will ask you questions because they're curious, but everybody says, oh yeah, no, I also had some, hey, my grandfather was Italian. No, they came from, where are you from? Yeah, no, I really want to visit, you know, like I want to go there. You know, they are extremely nice. They're lovely people. And young people, they speak English, okay? Young people speak English. Um, but of course, you know, not everybody speaks great English. Uh, uh, older people won't, maybe. And if you really want to enjoy the culture and know the country, uh, you will um, you will have to uh, learn Portuguese. That's it's a, it's a beautiful language. Uh, it's a great literature and culture. So you will definitely want to do that. Okay. So uh, practical things. Um, for example, when I went there, like um, I didn't have a health plan. Uh, Brazil has one of the largest uh, systems of public health in the world, and it does work, but of course uh, is not perfect, okay? Brazil has got some structural problems. So if you rely on public health, you may have to wait for some treatments. You probably will have to wait for some treatments. So it's not like it's perfect. So having a private health plan is what most people do here. And uh, it can be expensive. So depending on what you may want. So I didn't do that when I was a postdoc. So I got lucky. But uh, you know, if you have some emergency, you know, you may want at least pay something for dental, you may have like, you know, toothaches or something, hopefully, you won't have accidents or, or other emergencies, but it, it can be something you want to think about uh, a health plan. Um, and this is probably uh, the only practical really thing that you should think about. For the rest, everybody will be extremely, um, extremely helpful, okay? So you can ask, uh, everybody will be ready to help, okay? So I'm trying to stay within the 15 minutes. So thank you very much uh, for your attention and any questions uh, open, I hope again, answer i hope this was useful thank you paulo uh, we may wait uh, for sebastian's presentation before uh, before the question so now we will hear about sebastian's experience as a postdoc in brazil so please sebastian share your screen and the stage is yours thanks a lot Mathilde. um so i will start my presentation now I'm um, really happy to be with you today. Um, I will share a bit of my experience as a, as a postdoc in Brazil. So basically, uh, I got two different kinds of uh, support. The first one, I was fellow of the CAPES Prince program. So it's the Brazilian Higher Education Agency program for internationalization. Uh, and then uh, I start as a visiting professor uh, recently here at the uh, University of uh, Pernambuco, the Federal University of Pernambuco. So first, uh, about the Capes Prince, there is two different kinds of 
uh, opportunities to, to go to Brazil. The first one is an actual postdoc. Uh, it's six months, so it's quite short. Uh, you can apply to another uh, fellowship afterwards. That's what I did. I did two uh, six-month fellowship. And there's two uh, possibilities. There's the postdoc one and the young talent one. Um, to get the postdoc, you need to have only an experience outside Brazil. And to get the young talent, you need to be actual resident outside Brazil, which was my case uh, as, a, as a Belgian. Um, on the money we receive, the postdoc is really low. Uh, I'm not uh, encouraging any open researcher to get this kind of fellowship because it's too, too low to be able to survive uh, in big center, center city, even more with the family. Uh, the young talent is better, uh, and you get money to get uh, health insurance, as Paulo said, and also the flights to go to, to, to Brazil. The visiting professor in Brazil option is quite amazing. Uh, it's really shorter, it's 15 days. You have to be resident outside Brazil and linked with a foreign university. But what is really amazing is that you receive a, a, a good uh, fellowship. Uh, and everything is included. And so it's a good way to go to Brazil for the first time, to teach uh, some mini courses, like they say, to meet people, to get to create connection. That's really something I, I'm encouraging European researchers to try to do here in Brazil. So what you have to do um, to understand is the CAPES fringe is only open to a few pre-selected postgraduate programs. Uh, so uh, each univers every university do doesn't have it. Uh, and uh, only some selected program can uh, open this kind of course. And each department and each university can open the course whenever they want. So it's a bit complicated to know when a code is actually open or not. And there is no centralization of the course at the national level, which is a bit strange considering that's actually federal money. So like Paulo said, the best thing to do is to get in contact with colleagues in Brazil, to have connection with people in various universities who can actually say you told you, OK, so there is a call open there and we can submit something. And it can be through the uh, Association of European Researchers in Brazil that you ended having contact with some colleagues. Uh, the kind of application you have to submit uh, it's quite great and quite easy, actually. So uh, the curriculum VTA to submit can be in English, can be an international one. So it's really great. The proposal uh, is quite interesting to write as well. So of course, you have the introduction, the research objective, the schedule of research and teaching activities and everything. But then you have like those three uh, uh, items that I think quite quite interesting. The first is to explain how your project is going to contribute to uh, improve teaching and research network, to the, um, improve and to the, um, diffuse new kind of techniques and partnership. Uh, the second one is how your project is going to contribute to the scientific and te technological development uh, of Brazil, including the economic and social welfare in Brazil. So you can find in this code things that are close to the way the Marie Sklodowska Curie program, for instance, is thinking about two-way knowledge transfer, the transfer of knowledge between uh, partners, or the way you can have to think about impact, but not only the economic impact, but the social one and the scientific uh, impact the project will have. So you have to explain all of that um, in the in the proposal but the proposal have not to be submitted by yourself uh, as Paulo said it's submitted by uh, the sponsor by the program we want to invite you um, and so you can work on the proposal with them uh, and then they are going to submit it and start the uh, the process the results are quite quickly published on the university website, and the process is really straightforward. So when you get selected, really quickly, CAPS, the Brazilian IO Education Agency, is going to take contact with you. Um, the grant agreement is in English. The connection with them through the platform Linea Direta can be in English as well. And they're even going to pay uh, the first installments of the fellowship on the European bank account, which is quite amazing from the way Brazil is working. Um, so. The universities are all, all also going to send an invitation letters to you. Uh, and it's really important to be able to get your visa, uh, which is also a pretty straightforward process when you are still in Europe. So you go to your, your local Brazilian consulate uh, and you uh, take some uh, easy documents to get. Uh, and like in a few weeks, you can get your, your visa and, and uh, go to Brazil without any problem. A tip I can give you now uh, is to uh, create your CPF uh, 
uh, at the moment we are still in Europe. So the CPF is the Brazilian tax or identification number, and it's used to basically do everything in Brazil. If you want to get a SIM card for your phone when you arrive at the airport, you will need a CPF. Uh, and so you can do that when you are still in Europe. You only need a birth certificate. Uh, and if you are European citizen, in Belgium, for instance, we are receiving a multilingual European version. Portuguese is one of them. And so you can basically use it, create your CPF, and everything is resolved even before joining Brazil. Uh, once you are in Brazil, you will have to register as a foreigner uh, at the federal police. Again, it's really straightforward, but it can be long. So my tip also is to uh, take the appointment as soon as possible uh, to receive your uh, Registre National Migratorio, which is your mi migration identification in Brazil, and you will need it to open a bank account. And the bank account, again, is really important because to do local transfer, you will need it. And to receive the, the remaining uh, installments of the fellowship, you will need it as well. So the tip I can give you is once you have your temporary certificate from the federal police and your number, the Registre uh, National Migratorio number, you can actually go to a brick and mortar bank, like Banco do Brasil, for instance, and start the process to have a bank account uh, is quicker. There is also digital banks. Uh, Brazil is like the birthplace of uh, uh, big fintechs like Nubanki, for example, for instance. But you need the actual card to be able to do it, and the card can arrive in one, two, three months after you have the first appointment. So uh, it's a way to solve it uh, step by step. So basically, what 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 is great in the Cap Exchange is that it's really straightforward. It's friendly to foreigners. It's mostly doable in English, which is again really amazing for Brazil. And it's a really good way to discover the Brazilian academia, to actually have a first teaching or research experience in Brazil. In my case, I had the chance to teach a postgraduate seminar twice uh, at the uh, social work uh, graduate program here in Pernambuco in Recife, and it was amazing. The students were curious, they were engaged in the discussion, they were like actual researchers sharing the, the experience and wanting to exchange and to build a uh, connection and dialogue with uh, a foreign researcher coming in Brazil. So uh, that's really something that, that can change your life. It might be the best teaching experience I ever have. And it was thanks to uh, Capesprinch. What could be better is like the six months is actually quite short for an actual postdoc in Europe we are used to one or two years at least uh, but it's much better for the visiting professor the two weeks is a really good way to start having this connection the amount should be updated because it's a bit short for big urban center like uh, Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo which are uh, more expensive than Recife for instance and the onboarding process doesn't really exist so you are not introduced to the way the host university is working and you are really relying on uh, what your colleague can, can help you do so selecting a, a brazilian colleague that you're going to help you understand how things are working is really important about the professor visitant visiting professor uh, i would say that um it could be longer, so it's between three to 12 months, can be renewed up to four years when you are a foreigner, so it's quite good, at least it's my experience at, at UFP, and you have levels, so following your previous academic experience, you are going to be hired at different level, which is again quite great because it's not the case usually in Brazil, but there's no flights or health insurance included. Uh, which I, I don't know no one, I, I don't understand why, but that's that's how is it. Um, the application is more Brazilian, so you need the latest curriculum, which is like the standardized uh, Brazilian uh, uh, CV. Um, the proposal as well is, is less described. You need a work plan, a research project, a declaration of support, but it's not really explained what, what is needed. Um, and the objective is to contribute to what they call internationalization which can be a bit abstract to understand, but basically to open new uh, venues, new collaboration, new dialogues, I imagine. Um, what is again really important is that it's also a process start by the sponsoring program. So it's an internal administrative process. You are not submitting yourself uh, an application as visiting professors. The program have to submit it for you. Um, 
So each university has its own calendar. There can be a lot of variation between uh, universities. Sometimes they, there's no course at all. Um, and again, there is no centralized repository of the course. So <laughs> same tip, get in touch with Brazilian and colleagues is the best way to know what are the possibility to, to get this kind of position. And uh, uh, I see, coming back to Brazil. So the results are published on the university website, but the communication is really more difficult than it with CAPS because there is no centralized platform like uh, Linea Direta. Uh, and you are basically entering the Brazilian bureaucratic maze. Everything is in Portuguese, and everything is based on the rules of the Brazilian public administration. So you are going to be part, uh, a worker of the, for, for the Brazilian federal state during the time you are going to be there. It's making a lot of really difficult steps. Uh, so you need to ask for authorization for the Ministry of Labor, Ministry of Public Security. There's a lot of documents have to be translated in Portuguese. It's really, really much more complicated than the Cafe Springe. Uh, and it can take up to three months even before being able to start the visa process. Uh, again, when you are in Brazil, you will have to do extensive health exam, which is a bit strange for us as European, uh, being the host institution having to do it. Uh, a lot of additional documents, and you will need a bank account, open to bank account, to be able to receive your wage. So sometimes you will have to wait one or two months to be able to get your wage because you just don't have everything ready because everything is slow. Um, so what could be better? Of course, the application process can be more standardized and centralized, could be really uh, much easier. The bureaucratic process as such is quite long and complicated. It's not really friendly to foreigners. And there is no really mentoring included in the program. So the idea that you will have a colleague helping you to understand how things are working. And that's basically something we try to do with the association. We try to be this kind of uh, support uh, to help understand how things are working. On the other hand, what is great is that you have a really full immersion in the Brazilian academic system. It's really good for more experienced foreigners, people who already have Cafe Springe before, for instance, to be able to dive in the way a postgraduate program is working. It's a really good step uh, towards a permanent position in Brazil as well uh, to prepare the, the, the public uh, selection process. Uh, and it's going to be the next seminar topics. So uh, in September, we'll be able to talk about that. Uh, and it's allowing for longer duration. Uh, and you can actually start orienting students. You can uh, work in what they call scientific initiation, which is an amazing feature in Brazilian system where uh, under, undergrad students are actually uh, taking part to research project uh, you are uh, uh, dynamizing. Um, and the financial condition are quite good considering that they're actually acknowledging uh, your previous experience, which is not uh, the case usually uh, when you are passing a selection process. So that's it. I hope it gave you a better idea of how things are working when you are trying to start a postdoc in Brazil, and I would be happy to discuss uh, those issues further with you. Thanks. Thank you very much, Sebastian, for sharing your experience with Capes Sprint and as a visiting professor at the Federal University of Pernambuco. Uh, so I think now we can open the floor for questions, and I can read one already on the Q&A. Uh, someone asked, can you give an overview of deadlines for the postdoc opportunities in Brazil? I, I may start to, to answer this question. Um, so it is quite difficult uh, for us to give you exactly when are the different calls and when you should uh, expect them to, to, to came up. So as Sebastian says, some of the opportunities are um, arising from the universities. So you should have a look to the, the university webpage. And you should also have a look to uh, the CAPES webpage. A CNPK webpage, and then depending on the on where the university you wish to you want to go is located, you should have a look to uh, the FAP, which is the Fondation Gimpar ou Pesquise of the specific state where the university is placed, and depending on the FAP, uh, sometimes there is a, a 
you, you can send the, the, the postdoc project at any time. So for example, here I'm based in Sao Paulo and uh, the foundation agency, the local foundation agency is called FAPESP. And so uh, those who want to perform a postdoc can send the project at any time. So uh, have a look to the different websites. And uh, as Sebastian said, and also Paolo said, um, discuss with the researcher uh, with who you want to do your postdoc, and it will be the best person to give you information about the deadline uh, for the different calls. Yeah, and I will, I will share a bit of my experience about that because I didn't explain how I get my first Capital Squinch Fellowship. Uh, and basically, uh, after uh, my, my PhD Viva, I, stand, I start teaching in Belgium, uh, and my connection with Brazil was not uh, more alive anymore. I, I did part of my PhD in Brazil, so I had connection with the country, but I want to come back. And so I start writing emails to my colleagues, the people I met when I was doing my PhD, uh, and everybody was saying, okay, it's really complicated, they're cutting uh, fundings and stuff like that. And then by chance, someone sent me an email two days after saying, oh my God, just have this opportunity in Pernambuco, if you want, you can... Uh, contact the colleagues in Recife. The connection was really great because they knew the guy who was like a supervisor in Brazil. And so uh, basically it's through this kind of indirect connections that you discover uh, opportunities. And, and, and that's basically, that's why I'm here <laughs> uh, now. So I'm really uh, like encouraging you to go in this direction. And also, yeah, uh, yeah sorry, Paul. Sorry, I was gonna say something. Um, I have been, well, actually, Sebastian has given a lot of practical information, even mo much more than I did. I've been a bit um, more sparing, but because, first of all, details are a bit more fuzzy for me, which was 16 years ago, while they're fresher for Sebastian. And also, a few things have changed, okay? So, for example, I didn't even mention amounts of money, because now these are 16 years old updated. So... Uh, and lots of things have changed. For example, I came, I remember my CPF, I got it from the Banco do Brasil with a nice little blue card that now doesn't exist anymore, for example. So now it's different. Uh, Registro Nacional Migratorio, it was called Registro Nacional de Estrangero, and I got it from Policia Federal. Uh, you still get it from Policia Federal. Actually, I remember it wasn't a big process. Actually, I was surprised things were working pretty well. I was, I was expecting um, more uh, bureaucratic disasters coming from Italy. I was expecting horrors, but no, I thought actually that Brazil worked pretty okay and it was friendly to foreigners. Apart from the fact that lots of things are in Portuguese, even if they are translating lots of websites, but I, I was actually very favorably impressed, I have to say. I don't know, maybe I got just lucky. I have no idea. Um, I actually think that things are gotten much more bureaucratic now. I think things were probably a bit more straightforward when I came to Brazil, so I don't know. Yes, and once again, our association can help you in these bureaucratic steps. So if you are going to start a postdoc, please enter in contact with us and we will try to do our best to, to help you uh, to, to encounter the information and to to give you some tips about uh, what is the best sequence and so on to do this, this, uh, this administrative uh, pass. Uh, coming, coming back to the question about um, how to find the postdoc opportunity and the different deadlines of, for the different calls, uh, Miguel wrote in the chat, um, not um, like a tip for you uh, to find opportunity for a postdoc in Brazil, it's important to check informal social groups dedicated to this topic on Facebook and on the, the social network. So thank you, Miguel, for this, uh, this tip. We have another question uh, from Ikram, Ikram Bashir. Uh, is there any age limit to apply for postdoc? In the case of the two opportunities I explained, no, there, there is nothing about age, uh, both in the Capes Trinch or in the Professor Visitench. Perhaps in other programs, but in those ones, that was not something they were mentioning. Yes, yeah, same for me. I don't know of any of these limitations when 
I came, I was 40 already. So when I came to Brazil, I was 40 years old and I don't remember seeing any kind of limitation. And especially for, um, uh, for visiting professor, there aren't, some things are, are, are geared for like young talents or things like that. There is some limit like uh, uh, you have to be like maybe six years, 10 years from your PhD. But I mean, these are pretty clear, okay? These are pretty straightforward, but most positions are like, um, uh, <clears throat> lots of people here, lots of my colleagues, they talk about a postdoc, which we would call a sabbatical or something. So some person of like uh, 60 can, do, I'm gonna do a postdoc, which sounds pretty, st pretty weird for us, but they means that he's gonna go for a year uh, somewhere, uh, to do some research, uh, spend some time there. So that's what we call a sabbatical probably in, in Europe or in the US. So no, yeah, postdocs generally, I don't think so there is uh, age. I wanna do some, I wanna do one. I've never done one since I came to, to Brazil, since I was, uh, I became a professor. So, you know, all my colleagues are doing it. I wanna go a year somewhere, you know, like, uh, so I don't think there is a problem. Yeah, this is a great information, Paolo that here in Brazil, a postdoc is for a common postdoc position uh, as we use uh, this term in Europe, but it is also for sabbatical period. So it is quite confusing sometimes. So today we are focusing more about the traditional postdoc uh, in the terms that uh, what you do just after your, your PhD. So uh, another question from Guido Koenig, uh, visiting Visiting professor program is funded for each university or a national funding agency? So it's tricky because there is, the term is used in both things. So Capes Princh is using the term uh, visiting professor uh, for the two weeks visits I just uh, explained. And CAPS is organized at the federal level and the money you are paid by CAPS. So receive the money from the, the agency and it's a fellowship. So you are not receiving a wage. Uh, in the case of the visiting uh, professor position, where you're actually hired by the university, it's my case, no. That's, that's the reason why it's much more bureaucratic, because you have to pass through the same steps a Brazilian worker has to pass through, but as a foreigner. Uh, in this case, the money is coming from the federal state at the beginning, because public universities are funded in this way, but it's like something organized inside each local university. That's why they decide when they are going to open a call, how many positions and stuff like that. And uh, there is a next question from Ikram Bashir. From your experience, uh, from your experience, which funding agency pay highest and what is the maximum amount? So I think I, I answered that to that in my, in my presentation. Uh, Basically, CAPS is paying a flat um, fellowship for the different uh, moments, uh, type of, of, of fellowships. That they were not updated for a long time. So what is expected is that in the next years, we hope to have an update considering inflation, <laughs> which is quite hard here in Brazil, like it is in Europe. Uh, and for the, way, the, the wage you receive as visiting professor, they are hired, as I explained, uh, following the experience you have previously. Uh, but you are going to pay uh, uh, taxes on it. So the, the, the money I put, the value I put on the slides were after taxes uh, and after social security. Uh, but you have to take everything into account. CAPS is fellowship. You are not going to pay any tax when you are going to be hired. Everything is changing and you actually submit it to the Brazilian uh, in tax, taxation rules. Yes, and it depends also if you are uh, looking for a scholarship from, a scholarship from the Fondação de Amparo de Pesquisa, the FAP. Depending on the FAP, the, the salary is different for the postdoc. And also uh, considering postdoc, um, here in Brazil, it is not, it is like a scholarship. It is not uh, uh, what do we say? Like uh, a wage is not a sorry. wage. Yeah. yeah, a wage exactly. And uh, Sao Paulo is paying much better than the rest of Brazil. If you want to have a yeah, yes. in your state is better than in Pernambuco, for instance. Yes, but also Sao Paulo, uh, state of Sao Paulo, everything is more expensive. So that's why the scholarships are higher. 
So maybe uh, we didn't comment about the opportunity uh, to for doing a postdoc working with uh, industry. Do you have any experience? Is it uh, easy to do in Brazil, for example, for those who work in engineering fields? Is it easy to do a postdoc in Brazil in collaboration with industry? Well, uh, the connection between Industry and academia is one of the great problems of Brazil. Uh, in some cases, it's developed in others, it's not. Like in the aerospace case, there is only Embraer. So in the aeronautical part, the space case is very little developed. And outside Sao Paulo, there isn't much hope. Like in Brazil, we have a big problem because there isn't really an um, industrial vocation, okay, in the Distrito Federal. It's all like uh, government services. There is a few, there are a few high tech companies, but there isn't really, in, there are really industries. In Sao Paulo, it's better, of course. Mostly like the space stuff is in San Jose Los Campos and Embraer is there as well. And INPE is there, ITA is there. So that's the aerospace uh, pole of Brazil. Um, there are some cases of, for example, Petrobras. Petrobras, yes. Uh, Petrobras gives a lot of funding to research. Uh, so you can probably have uh, some postdoc founded uh, with uh, Petrobras uh, projects, okay? Uh, but I don't know, it, it depends. I mean, it's like also the easy you have to see with uh, locals. I, I can think of things, of course, um, like, Industries will fund your postdoc in the sense that they will fund someone's research, and this researcher will ask uh, for a scholarship for you because he has like the possibility of having postdocs, uh, PhD students, master students within the framework of his project. But it's not like uh, from abroad that you contact like a Brazilian company and they say I want to do a postdoc or something. They, they, it's not the way it works. They will yes, of course money from companies goes into funding research, but you will not have a direct link from abroad to a Brazilian industry uh, to come there to research in Brazil. They will fund someone and someone will fund you, okay? So yes, Brazilian industries fund research, um, especially things like Pedro Bryce, for example, uh, comes to mind, but it won't be a direct link of between you and, a, and an industry. Okay, so it'll be something different. I hope this was clear, I don't know. Yeah, thank you, Paolo, for, for your answer. As the next question we have is from Nicola. Nicola is asking uh, for you to talk a little bit about the different expectations that Brazilians uh, have regarding a postdoc position. Like, is it more about teaching, something like a teaching assistant, or about publishing papers, uh, is the postdoc student in charge of a small research group, or should he expect to work on her on her home, uh, how much interaction with the advisor, and so on? So, can you talk a little bit about this, please? Yeah, I think it depends a lot of the of the universities and the department we are going to go. What is great with the Capes is that you have a lot of flexibility to build your project in dialogue with the host, with the university and the department are going to welcome you. Um, in my case, what I really discovered doing that, and it was really different from my experience doing PhD when I was doing only research, I was doing field work in Sao Paulo, and then doing postdoc, I, I enter a postgraduate program actually, uh, and they told me, okay, you can, you can give a class on whatever you want. We have like topicos especiais, special topics, and you can give 60 hour seminar about the topic that you think is interesting. And I found that amazing. I never had this freedom in Belgium to do something like that. Um, and what I discovered is this really specific way, what they called postgraduate postgraduate studies are working in Brazil, where teaching for master and PhD on the one hand and research on the other, on, on the other hand are completely linked. Uh, what, I, what I did with the students, I mean, there were 12 in the first class. It was a really amazing seminar. Um, we, we, we did, I did teaching and we did uh, mentoring and supervision and research at the same time. I mean, everything was linked in the, in the postgraduate class. 
And that's something that is really different from what we are calling master studies in, in, in Belgium, at least. And even from what I had experienced as a PhD student in Belgium, where we didn't have these kind of seminars. So I think you can, it depends also the kind of confidence you have with the people who are welcoming you and stuff like that. But in my case, at the social work department, uh, I, get, I got lucky, perhaps. Uh, and with them, the connection was quite, quite great. I discovered that the specificity of Brazilian academia, which is really worth it. Uh, yeah, I wanted to say also that um, it depends a lot where you go. I mean, it's completely different uh, depending on where you are. Uh, very different within uh, between a university and a research institute where I was. As I said, in a research institute, uh, you you will not teach definitely. Uh, you may give some seminars if you want. Uh, I had contact with this master student because he was working with me. So what I was expected was work in the lab, work in this project, and develop. Uh, develop some equipment for the lab, uh, publish some papers. Uh, so, but I wasn't really say, teaching or anything. But of course, in a university, uh, it may be different. And it depends a lot also, as I said, all the practicalities uh, and uh, like how much contact with your uh, uh, supervisor, with your boss. I don't know. I, I got lucky. Um, as I said, like my, my future boss became friends with my uh, supervisor at Southampton, which is also one of my best friends. So I also was very friendly with him. So we became friends. I went to Brazil during my PhD twice. Visited him. So basically by the time I went there, October, 2006, we were fast friends. Okay, I remember he came to Guarulhos to pick me up. We went to his house at lunch with him and his wife. Then he took me to the extra supermarket to buy the necessary stuff. And in, in the evening, he took me like to a flat belonging to a friend of his, and I was settled in Brazil, basically. I was like in a few hours, I was all, all set, I had all I needed, and I had my own house in Brazil, and I had a friend who is still my friend after 20 years. So, but I think I got very lucky. Probably in, in other places, it won't be, so it will be a bit more formal, but I would say that probably in Brazil, you can expect people to be very friendly to you. And it's probably very likely that you will become friends with your um, supervisor, with your boss or everything. I, as I said, uh, people are very friendly here. Okay, You must be very unlucky if you get to a place and you have problems knowing people or getting help from people or support, uh, like, you know, you won't feel lonely, okay, I, I guess. I don't know, or maybe I've been very lucky, I don't know. But as I said, I love this country to bits. Yes, thank you, Paolo and Sebastian. So um, I think that what we can sum up is that depending on where you are going and your scholarship and uh, the opportunities that are given to you, so your postdoc will be very different. So in some cases you will have to teach and it will be a great experience. Otherwise you will just focus on research. Um, and this, I think an advice that we can give to the attendees is to ask before writing the postdoc project to ask to your supervisor, what uh, does he expect from your postdoc? So is it more to develop a, a research, to publish, to supervise the other students, uh, to give some classes? So ask all of these questions to your supervisor and then you will see if it fits your expectations or not. Um, and uh, someone ask, uh, is, there any, is there any chance to get permanent permanent academic position after postdoc in Brazil. So we know that postdoc may be uh, a step between the PhD and a permanent academic position. And so if you aim at continuing um, in academia before and after your postdoc, so you should also have a look to the requirements to get a permanent position in the country you aim at living. So for example, in Brazil, um, 
you should have given you, you should have uh, taught some classes uh, published a lot uh, supervised uh, students and so you should uh, have a look to what are the requirements to get a permanent position at the beginning of your postdoc in order to check all the criteria all the requirements so uh, it, the, this topic about uh, how to get a permanent academic position will be discussed in our next web webinar. So it will be uh, the 20th of September. And you will find the link at the end of the presentation. We will share the link with you to register to, the, to this webinar. Uh, but from now, we can continue with the question about a postdoc in Brazil. Um, if you have some non-Brazilian funding for a postdoc and want to use it to stay in a Brazilian institution, how difficult is it? What do you need to negotiate with the Brazilian university? So I can perhaps answer for the PhD first, because that was my experience during PhD. Uh, I went to Brazil to do field work. And the guy who became my co-supervisor, uh, like he welcomed me quite easily. They wrote a letter saying that I was visiting at the sociology department of the Universidade de São Paulo, and that was it. It was really, really easy to get the visa as well. It's, it's an easy process because it was nothing moved between Europe to Brazil. It was only me going there, spending five to six months, and then going back to Belgium. Uh, I guess that when you are starting a postdoc, it's much complicated, even more if there is issue of uh, agreements to be signed and those kind of stuff. But um, Connie McMahon spoke about that quite well in the keynotes. So I think can be something to, to, to give, dig into. Uh, the keynote was a really good way to, to have a look on that. Yes, yeah, so you can have a look to the last webinar that was organized by our association uh, about the, the academic system in Brazil. And so you will get some info about it, uh, I guess. Another question is about, uh, so you talk a little bit about uh, the administrative processes that you need to do uh, after getting the acceptance uh, for your postdoc. And uh, what about the recognition of your foreign diplomas here in Brazil? How does it work? Is it easy? Is it something that takes time? Paulo, perhaps you have experience. In my case, what, is, what was great is that I never had to do uh, any kind of recognition in Brazil. Capes Princh uh, accepted my Belgian PhD uh, and the visiting professorship we're not asking for a, a recognition, a recognition in Brazil. So hopefully I didn't have to pass through what is called the Plataforma Carina, Car Carolina Bori, which is the process of recognition of foreign diplomas by public universities in Brazil, which is not by such uh, difficult to get, but it's really long. So, <laughs> so you, need a lot, you need a lot of documents. You need to pay the university one or 2,000 reais to be able to get it. Uh, and so you will need it if you want to get a permanent position. Uh, but for postdoc, in my case, and even for visiting professor, hopefully it was not necessary. OK, this is actually extremely funny. It's funnier than that, OK? So I didn't need any recognition to do my postdoc here, my visiting professorship, I didn't get any recognition to be, get my permanent position here. So I just presented my PhD, my degrees uh, from Italy, from the, my master's from the States, my PhD from the UK, my it's very complicated, right? Degrees from three different countries. And I didn't, nobody wanted anything Nothing, not even at IMPE, not at the UMB when I got my position. The only thing when I had to get my, um, my PhD uh, recognized and actually, so now I actually also have a doctorado from the Universidad de Brasilia in Ciencias Mecanicas because they don't give PhDs in aerospace engineering. So they gave me an equivalence. So now I have a doctorado. 
The only thing I needed this was when MEC, the Ministry of Education, came to evaluate the courses. Okay, you do a periodic uh, evaluation of courses um, from the Ministry of Education in Brazil, and they give you notas, which is from one to five for undergrads and from one to seven for uh, graduate courses, but it's a different, different scales. Okay, so um, when there was a visit, it was M shared between energy engineering, because when I got in, there was no aerospace. I opened the course together with a colleague. So when I entered, I entered into energy and I'm still shared between energy and aerospace. So no problem, nobody wanted to do anything. But when MEC came uh, for the visit uh, to evaluate energy engineering, and I didn't have my, they didn't recognize my PhD. So for them, I had just a, a master or a graduation or something like that. I did have no PhD for them because it wasn't recognized. So they disregarded my English PhD. Said, okay. So before the, the visit for the aerospace, I had to run and have this thing recognized um, because, and I had to do it to get like apostillas. I think normally simplified that to get like lots of strange things. Um, and in the end, the only thing that simplified is that um, actually the University of Brasilia can recognize it, so they could give me an equivalence. So I didn't have to pay anything in Brazil for this. I had to pay stuff uh, from a carto, from like a notary republic in the UK or something like that. But I mean, um, I didn't have to pay in Brazil. Uh, because the university did it, my same university, and they gave me a PhD, they gave me a doc doctorado from the Universidad de Brasilia. But I remember, for example, the um, person who studied with me in Southampton, who also had, of course, a PhD from my same group, from the same university, when he had to take his position at INPE, he has a permanent position as a researcher at INPE now, um, uh, the National Institute for Space Research, uh, he had this thing and I helped him. So basically he sent his PhD thesis here and uh, I helped him get his recognition from the Universidad de Brasilia. So he got the validation of his, uh, of his PhD from here. I, I don't know if he had to pay something, maybe yes, because he was external. But I mean, it's very strange. The only, the only time when this was necessary was for the visit of the Ministry of Education and Culture. Nobody asked me anything during my uh, concurso, for example. Okay. Oh, by the way, to get a position to a public university, you have to pass through a concurso here. Uh, it's a public uh, selection. It's pretty formal. Um, if you, of course, want to get into a private university, I have no idea how it's done. They probably can hire people. Or they probably have an interview process or something like that. I don't know. But if, from a public university, both federal and state, I think you can, they have to do a concurso. It's a public selection has to be published uh, and everything. So it's a formal process with several kind of tests and interviews uh, and, and things like that. Perfect. Thank you very much, Paolo and Sebastian. Uh, so I think we are uh, finishing this webinar. Uh, I can see no more question in the chat. Uh, so just to summarize, maybe the first step to find a postdoc in Brazil should be to get in contact with a professor from here. So uh, you can find uh, all the curriculum of all the professors in Brazil in a platform that is called Lattice. So on this platform, you will see their curriculum, their research lines. Uh, you will see also uh, it is a database where you can find uh, the Brazilian research groups that work on specific thematics. So first, you should have a look to this web page. Um, find uh, researchers that are working in the area you are interested in, get in contact with these professors and discuss about the possibility to get a scholarship. Uh, if you have some difficulty to navigate this latest system that some, sometimes it's a little bit complicated and it is in Portuguese, and if you really want to do a postdoc in Brazil, you can enter in contact with us. Um, how to get in contact with us? You enter the Eraxis platform and there you will find um, a form that you can fill and it will be sent to us and we will answer uh, giving you 
all the information we can to help you to come uh, to Brazil for doing a postdoc. And so uh, I would like to thank Paulo and Sebastian for sharing your experience uh, as Europeans that came to Brazil doing a postdoc. Uh, our next webinar will be on the 20th of September at 10 and 30. Uh, Brazilian time. You can register on that link. Uh, it will be about how to get a permanent position in a Brazilian university. So subscribe, register to this event, and we will meet uh, the 20th of September to discuss about this next topic. I would like to thank all the attendees uh, for being here today. And once again, if you are a European researcher in Brazil, you can join our association and uh, come to, to share your experience and enter this network. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Ciao.